let me get up there. Um, you know, this um, event today is really important for us as a college. Um, and to give you a little bit of a background on the event, um, this event and this series of events, this is the second in a series of events, um, was really conceptualized after the killings of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile last summer. Um, and Miranda Harris, our student, came to me um, and asked if we could hold some kind of forum, some kind of event for our students and our community to come together and to process those events, but also to discuss what we as a community, as a school, could do about that. Um, and that eventually grew into a series of events, of which this is the second one. Um, and it's really, I think, just a tragedy that, that we're here today following this really horrific week where we've seen the brutal killings of Terrence Crutcher and Keith Lamont Scott at the hands of law enforcement. Um, it's been a difficult week for all of us, I think. Um, but I think what makes uh, me hopeful about today's event is that we really did want this event to focus uh, or to provide not just an opportunity for all of us to discuss and process what happened and the factors contributing to this problem, but also to focus on identifying some solutions. At the Graduate College of Social Work, our vision, um, like the big idea that frames everything that, what we, everything that we do is to achieve social, racial, economic, and political justice. Um, that big idea motivates everything that we do as a school, from the content of our curriculum, to the faculty that we hire to educate our students, to what we expect from our graduates, um, or from our students when they graduate. And we know that in order to achieve that vision, to really be successful in achieving justice, we have to focus on solutions. So I hope that for all of us here today, as we listen to our speaker this morning and our panelists a little bit later today, that we'll be thinking about what we collectively can do so that not one more innocent black life is taken at the hands of law enforcement. Um, I know that today we likely won't identify all of the solutions to that problem. At the end of the day, we won't have ended structural and institutional racism. Um, but I want us to be a part of that. I want our school to be a part of that. And I hope that all of you here today want to be a part of that and that you'll join us in, in that effort. So I really appreciate all of you being here today. I'm going to turn it back over to Miranda to introduce our keynote speaker. So as Dean Datliff said, um, I approached him about having this forum and I kind of backed into the conversation with him originally, um, illuminating the issues that I feel um, are contributing factors versus the big elephant in the room, which is race. Um, Dean Datliff promptly wanted to address the bigger issue, which is race. Um, <laughs> and he was, but he was very conscious of all of the other uh, contributing factors. And so, the one thing um, after kind of having this discussion over and over again, as you usually do with like your peers and your friend, I mean your family, um, and even some of your colleagues, the one thing that we can't change is that our skin color. So um, when we decided to address the social and economic complexities within the infrastructure such as law enforcement, health services, education, economic policy, and government services, we felt like it would help restructure the community along with the lives of those that live here. So at the moment, I would ask that those that feel comfortable to participate, please stand up, put your hands in the air as I read the names of those that have lost their lives as a result of the police use of force since our event, since our first event that was dated in August 13th. Sylvie Smith, Colby Friday, Kenny Watkins, Omer Ismail Ali, Brandon Coles, Kelly Forte, Dante Taylor, Alfred Toe, Jaquan Terry, Lavanya Riggins, Michael Thompson Jr., Jerome Damon, Moses Rubin, Robert Brown, Saqid Irish, 
Iris, excuse me, Gregory Frazier, Terrence Sterling, Markel Bivens, Tyree King, Nicholas Glenn, Terrence Crutch Crutchert, Dahir Aiden, Philip Hansen, and Keith Lamont Scott. Thank you. So now I want to introduce our keynote speaker, a graduate of Hartford College with a Master's of Arts in Psychopathology from the University of Paris and a PhD in Social Psychology from Harvard. He has taught at Princeton and later joined the Rice University's Sociology Department. Excuse me. Sociology Department, excuse me, and he's also the founder and director of Kinder's Institute of Urban Research. Research. Um, his name is Dr. Steven Kleinberg. Everybody give him a round of applause. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all. Let's see, am I on? Is this working? Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and to share with you what we think we've learned from 35 years of surveys in Harris County, Texas. And I, it does provide, I think, a valuable context for the focused issues that you're all focusing on that are so critical to what kind of an America are we building in the 21st century. But the, um, we did this uh, first survey back in 1982. Houston was booming. Houston was booming. One million people had moved into Harris County between 1970 and 1982. 82 percent of the jobs in, in Houston were tied into the price of oil. Oil increased tenfold in value during the 1970s. The rest of the country was having its Carter malaise, its stagflating 70s. Houston was booming. It was also a city world famous for having imposed the least amount of controls on development of any city in the Western world. So what if it's ugly? Who cares if it smells? It's the smell of money. Come on down. So we did a one-time survey to measure how are people balancing this great growth with growing concerns about what kind of city are we building with all this affluence. Never occurred to us to do it again. Two months later, the oil boom collapsed. Price of oil suddenly fell from $32 to $28 a barrel, but we've been building a barn on the basis of $50 oil, and 100,000 jobs were lost in Houston by the end of 1983. We said, we better do this survey again. And for 35 years, we've been taking a representative random sample of Harris County residents reached by random telephone numbers, a random adult in each random household, asking people with identical questions over the years, how do you see the world? What is happening in your life? And we have sat back and watched the world change. Is this working all right? Is this, it seems to be there's a... Uh, just put it back up here or forget it and just use this? Hey, uh, this may be better. Okay. So, yeah, the question is how do we... Well, let me just do this one. You want to do that? I guess that's probably right. Okay, let me come up here. All right. So the city went into major recession and then recovered into a restructured economy and a demographic revolution. And these are the changes occurring across all of America, nowhere more clearly seen or more sharply articulated than here in Houston, Texas. So let me just remind us of what that means. So the next, next slide. Okay, hold it. Now this is the 30 years after World War II. We emerged out of that war in 1945, the sole economic power on the planet. All of our potential competitors were decimated by the war experience. And the poorest 20% of American families more than doubled their incomes in the 30 years after World War II. The richest 5% doubled theirs. 38% of the jobs in America were union jobs. The unions can negotiate with the corporations to ensure that workers shared in the prosperity of the company. And, and this was a time of broad-based prosperity, of a rising tide lifting all boats. We still like to think of this as a world that we still live in. It's a very different world of the last 30 years. I'll get to in a second. But what was significant here is that those were the years between 1945 and 1964 when we celebrated the stay-at-home housewife mother in suburbia. The average American woman gave birth to 3.6 children between 1946 and 1964, and the baby boom was launched upon the land, preceded and followed by baby bus generations. So for 60 years, there's been this bulge going through the American system. Democrats talk about it like a pig being swallowed by a python. Not very comfortable either for the pig or the python. The leading edge of those 76 million babies turned 70 this year. And we are going to watch a literal doubling of the number of Americans over the age of 65 in the next 25 years. 
as that bulge begins to move through the system, believe it or not, every single day between now and 2030, 10,000 Americans will turn 65. And by 2030, the youngest of that 76 million will have turned 65, heading off into the wilderness, being replaced by a very different generation of Americans. The baby boom generation is overwhelmingly Anglo, and the new generations are a mix of all the ethnicities of the world. I'll come back to that in just a second. But here is the last 30 years. Next slide. When virtually all the benefits of economic growth have gone to the richest 5%, most of that to the richest 1%, and a striking redistribution of earnings out of the hands of the poor and the middle class into the hands of the rich and the super rich in a way that we have never seen before in American history, with the sole exception of 1928, just after the Roaring Twenties and before the total collapse of the American economy in the Great Depression. What happened? The American economy changed so profoundly Two big things happened. Number one, globalization. Fareed Zakaria said it best in his book, The Post-American World, what we're dealing with in the world today is not the decline of the West, it's the rise of the rest. We are in a worldwide global economic system. Companies can produce goods anywhere, sell them everywhere. If you are doing a job that I can train a third world worker to do and I pay that third world worker $15 a day to do that job, I'm not going to pay you $15 an hour. And if you are doing a job that I can program a computer to do, I'm going to replace your job with an intelligent machine. We are suddenly in a new world that never existed before. Education is always a nice thing to have. Never in human history has education become so absolutely critical in enabling a person to find a job to support a family in the global knowledge economy of the 21st century. Next slide reflects the, the, the distribution of jobs in here. Back, next, okay, in 1973, there were 91 million jobs in this country. And of those jobs, next, click again. 32% uh, of, all, of all those jobs in, in, in 1970 you, could, you were eligible for as a high school dropout. Another 40% required no more than high school degree. 70% of all the jobs in America required no more than high school or less. And today, 60% and, and the projection for 2020, hit it, 65% of all the jobs will exist in America in 2020, 65% will require education beyond high school. You don't have four years of, of university experience, but you need one or two years in a community college to acquire the technical skills that will enable you to get the jobs and to support a family in the global economy. And the public understands that. We asked in our survey last year. Next slide. Uh, to be successful in today's world, is it necessary to get an education beyond high school, or are there many ways to succeed with no more than a high school diploma? Hit it. 60% of all Houstonians said you've got to get education beyond high school. I fight a losing battle with people who say if only those Latinos and African Americans valued education and understood its importance the way the Asians and the, and the Anglos do, there would be no problem. Everyone would get the education they need. So I can break this down by ethnicity, and here's what you find. Blacks and Hispanics, along with Asians, overwhelmingly recognize you've got to get education beyond high school to get a decent job in today's economy. It is Anglos who continue to believe one can make it and the jobs are here for everybody. And, and so what this reminds us of is that if African Americans and Latinos are not getting the education they need to position themselves for success in the global knowledge economy of the 21st century, it is demonstrably not because they don't value that education or understand its importance. It's because of what concentrated poverty does to your ability to succeed in the public school system. And we have isolated the poor in the inner cities. So HISD with 216,000 kids, 89% are African American Latino, 80% qualify for reduced cost of free lunch programs. And all of those problems of affordable housing, of access to health care, of, of uh, support systems that are so central to being able to, to get a decent job and to be, to be able to do well in school are, are centrally critical to what kind of a future will we build for Houston. One example is there's a, one of the moments of truth in American education is third grade reading. If you're not reading at third grade level in third grade, you are four times more likely to drop out of high school. And the single most powerful predictor, whether you can read at third grade level, is did you start kindergarten ready to learn to read? And rich kids start kindergarten one and a half to two years ahead of poor kids. And that reality of, so the need as we work together to build the Houston in America of the 21st century to get quality education.